during our very productive and very hopefully very interesting day, uh, we spoke about past and about the present events. And now we have our forest panel about the future of the conflict. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you myself. My name is Ala Hurska. I'm a graduate student of the Professor Marples, and I'm also an associate analyst of the uh, International Center for Policy Studies, Kyiv. Uh, the topic of our uh, fourth panel, Future of the Donbass, Canada's Role. Uh, we will have uh, three presentations, 20 minutes each. Uh, represented by experts from three different fields, uh, history, political science, and law. And I, I hope it will be very interesting. First speaker is Mr. Ernest Geidel, uh, who is a PhD candidate in the history department of the University of Alberta. And his topic will be from see you in Donetsk to I will never return to Donetsk, Ukrainian IDPs and the future on Donbass. I will start with pretty basic uh, matter, terms and estimates of Ukrainian IDPs. So who are, who are defined uh, as uh, IDPs, internally displaced persons, according to Ukrainian law? This legal, this legal status can be play, claimed by people, both Ukrainian citizens and foreigners, so not just uh, citizens, who after March 2014 left occupied territories of Ukraine, meaning Crimea and parts of Donbass, and uh, based on that uh, status of, uh, based on that uh, 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 spatial displacement, they can legally claim this official status of internally displaced persons. In Ukrainian term terminology, внутрішньо перемещение особи. However, unofficially, a much shorter term is used uh, by IDPs themselves, Ukrainian public and media, Paracela Paracelancy. Uh, the term doesn't, literal, literal translation into English of Paracelancy means simply people, people who resettled from one place to another. Uh, by contrast, um, Russian Migration Service, Federalna Služba Migracji Rosji, they using they describe they describe people who fled Donbas into Russia as refugees, беженцы. There is a difference between Ukrainian and Russia and using of terminology to describe essentially the same group of people. Officially, according to the Ukrainian Ministry of Social Policy, uh, the data is from April 2018. There are one million. 496,713 IDPs in Ukraine. Around, around 20,060 are from Crimea, the rest are from Donbass. Unofficial estimates are higher, if they range around 1.1 million, since um, a number of IDPs prefer to not to register, not to register officially as IDPs with Ukrainian states. There's also a group of uh, so-called fake IDPs, uh, according to Ukrainian law, to be in an IDP, you cannot, uh, you, after you registered as IDP in Ukraine, uh, to maintain the status of the IDP, you need to live, you need to stay in Ukraine. So you cannot, if you return to the occupied territories, you're losing your status of IDPs. In this context, many IDPs are regarded as fake IDPs because they uh, live, uh, they live on bus, they register, they register, in Ukraine uh, to receive financial to receive financial support or to receive um, you know, their pensions and they return and they return back to the occupied parts. How many of the IDPs can be considered in this category of fake IDPs is unknown. Uh, one estimate that one of the estimates which um, Georgi Tuka, it's a Ukrainian official who works for the Ministry of uh, Temporarily Occupied Territories and IDPs. I'll get I'll get to him in a, in a minute. He estimates that uh, po it's possible that around half of IDPs are so-called fake IDPs. What's the position of the Ukrainian state against IDPs? What it's doing for them? First of all, uh, there is a special ministry created for to deal with IDPs. Uh, it was uh, the Ministry of Temporarily Occupied Territories and Internal Displaced Persons. The ministry was created in April 2016. The ministry was created on the basis of previous agency, state agency, state agency for reconstruction of Donbass, which was created on September 10th. Both the agency and ministry was headed by Vadim Chernesh, and the ministry is now being headed by Vadim Chernesh. By his education and his profession, he's a lawyer. Currently, the legal status of the IDPs in Ukraine is regulated by 22 pieces of legislation. There are five laws which deal with IDPs, 17 government decrees. I challenge anyone to try to read at least through half of them. 
believe me, you will be you will be quite perplexed. However, the most important Ukrainian official, or so to say, the most uh, visible figure, uh, Ukrainian state figure, which is uh, talks about the issue of IDPs or talks about the issue of temporarily occupied territories, is Horgi Tuka, who is a deputy deputy to Vadim Chernish. Uh, but he is much more, he's actually much more recognizable face uh, than Chernish when dealing with, uh, when discussing the issue of IDPs from the point of view of Ukrainian state. He's a businessman and a volunteer who became prominent after Euromaidan of 2004, after Euromaidan of 2014. And at uh, a certain time from 2000, to from the, if I'm not mistaken, from 2015 to 2016, he was the head of so called. Uh, Luhansk civil military administration, some some sort of Luhansk civil no civil administration, some something like that. So the first was the ministry. The second, the second most important uh, Ukrainian Ukrainian official institution which deals with uh, IDPs, is the Ministry of Social Policy. This is the ministry through which uh, most of the financial most of the fi finances uh, are going towards IDPs. Uh, towards the IDPs. Number one expenditure in uh, spending on IDPs are pensions and monthly financial aid. Totals, according, accordingly to Ukraine official sources, total official, total state spending on the IDPs from August 2014 uh, to December, by December 2017, was 56.9 billion of hryvnia. According to the pensions funds, it's a state, also a state uh, institution, official institution in Ukraine, uh, the data is from January 2018. There are um, uh, five, 516,000 and 100 pensioners among the IDPs. So rough, roughly one third of the IDPs are uh, pensioners. Now to put that number in the context that almost uh, 57, 57 billion of hryvnia to give you a slight context because for people unfamiliar with uh, with the currency, it might just sound like a very abstract number. Uh, according to Ukraine official statistics, there is uh, 11.7 uh, millions of pensioners in your pensioners in Ukraine right now, and the total spending, the total amount of pensions paid to them in the last year was um, 200, 286, 286 uh, billions of hryvnia. So you can compare how much is paid to the whole uh, whole country in terms of whole country and how much paid to the specifically group. Legally, the IDPs do not enjoy full, full citizens' full citizen rights in Ukraine. Uh, they, cannot print, they cannot vote in lo local elections. And this uh, piece of Ukrainian le legislature was challenged uh, a number of times. And recent, the recent decision by Ukraine Supreme Court, uh, where Homni sued, uh, supported, that, uh, supported with uh, norms that IDPs cannot vote in local elections. The least, uh, the, the problem which uh, plagues most of the IDPs is funding housing, funding accommodation is actually the least funded, the least funded uh, in, um, in expenditure of Ukrainian state. And by April 2018, the state provided housing only for 63 IDP families. So you have a number of people one and a half million, and only 63 families out of them received some sort of a housing. From the IDPs, let's look from the uh, state policies against IDPs, let's look at the group itself. Now, uh, IDPs, is IDPs uh, especially from Donbass, from Donbass, since they're such a significant group, uh, face challenges of integration into Ukrainian society. And the very, the very, the very subject when you say that some, some, something faces challenges of integration, that that implies that some something, uh, something is not uh, working well. Now, Ukraine, as, a, as any country, uh, has a number of regional stereotypes, positive and negatives. The first widespread negative, so the one, the reason why, uh, the reason why ADPs face uh, challenges in Ukrainian society is not just to the lack of finances or underfinancing of the uh, not receiving uh, uh, enough social help, financial help, but also some negative stereotypes that surround them. And those stereotypes, those stereotypes were formed before they even were started. So the first widespread negative stereotypes about people from Donbass, Zhitili Donbassa, were registered in Ukraine uh, during the Orange Revolution of 2004. Uh, those stereotypes, uh, just to give you one example, in 2004, uh, I was actually living in Kiev, and uh, I was not, I was not, I was not living on Maidan, but uh, I was, so to say, uh, 
going to the Akadea, to the uh, Rushevsky, uh, to Rushevsky Street, and one of the popular saying uh, among those people who were at Maidan was "Ne syf podjezdje, ty że nie Donetsky," meaning that do not, do not pass uh, podjezd as an entrance to an apartment building. It doesn't, it doesn't actually have an, a good translation into English. Do not, do not pass at the entrance. You are not from Donetsk. Uh, this is uh, so. The problem was that uh, near Maidan there was not enough public toilets, and many people were pissing everywhere. So to to tell them that not to behave like that, uh, people people actually came up with this phrase that uh, you are better than somebody from Donetsk, so do not piss do not piss around. So you know. Uh, um, Quite interesting. The stereotypes, the stereotypes again reemerged during Yanukovych presidency, Yanukovych presidency from 2010 to 2014. Uh, perhaps one, the most public and the most famous example of uh, such, uh, you know, negative attitude, negative attitudes towards uh, people from Donbass, Italy, Donbass, was the famous, was the famous, uh, was the famous shouting by um, ultras, hardcore fans of the uh, football football club Dynamo. Спасибо жителям Донбасса за президента Пидораса. Thanks to thanks to thank uh, our thanks to people of Donbass for president. And you can Google Пидорас. By the way, the original video was deleted by YouTube, and uh, before the, before its deletion, it, it had more than 1.5 million of views. Uh, the link which I provided on the slide is actually from the from the fan club, so, so from the ultras themselves. Um, this, this uh, negative, this uh, accumulation of negative stereotypes against people from Donbass actually let one of one of journalists declare that Ukrainian society has a problem with Donbass Donbassophobia, phobias or negative stereotypes surrounding people from Donbass. So, what are what are most the common what are the most common stereotypes about people of Donbass? Now, remember, I'm talking about stereotypes, not real people. Uh, that they are anti-Ukrainian. They are pro-Russian. Uh, alcoholism is widespread amongst uh, people from Donbass. They are rude. They are very brutal both on words and their actions. And they are quite semi-criminal or qua quasi-criminal, or even many of them are still remain criminal. To be honest, the party of regions never really dealt, uh, the situation was not helped, the situation was not helped with Donbassophobia by the behavior of the party regions itself. The party of regions never really, never really dealt with the Ukrainophobia of some of its members uh, between 2004 and 2014. Uh, many people who lived in Ukraine perhaps still remember the so quite infamous uh, Mikola Levchenko, or Nikolai Levchenko, who was a member of the party of regions and who in 2000, in 2000 uh, 2009, if I'm not mistaken, declared that uh, there is no such a nationality as Ukrainian. Ukrainians and Russians are simply one one people. He, he was not. He was not. Uh, he, he was not the only one. The Donbass war, which started in 2014, only is further strengthened with negative stereotypes in Ukrainian society. So it's not. It's not. It's quite unsurprising that, uh, thanks to to those negative stereotypes, IDPs routinely face uh, unsympathetic and hostile attitude, attitude when they are looking for jobs or accommodation. Quite often, what quite often, what for what they can hope in those situations is simply just indifference. For people who are not from Ukraine, uh, perhaps it might be quite strange how you immediately can guess if somebody is from Donbass. Well, when you look for a job or you look for accommodation, eventually your employer or your tentative landlady or landlord will check your passport. And Ukrainian passport contains registration. And Ukrainian passport shows not only your current registrations, but all previous registrations. So if somebody, if I'm, for example, if I'm from Donetsk and I arrive in Kiev, and I look for a, for a flat, for an apartment, my uh, tentative landlord would check my passport, and he, would, and he would see that I used to live in Donetsk. And that's how people in Ukraine know where you come from. So having this Donbass registration in the passport became sort of a, like a curse. The struggle is uh, quite quite strong with getting, with finding jobs or finding or finding accommodation just because just because you arrived from Donbass. Uh, Ukrainian media also reported. Uh, I don't have a statistics uh, because uh, nobody actually does a statistic of this kind. But uh, just uh, looking from the online Ukrainian media. 
you can see that the number, the number of other DPs reported personal attacks on them. So personal safety is a concern. Personal safety is a concern for the IDPs. All of the cases which I looked through, and I looked through seven cases for personal attacks on IDPs, none of those cases were positively, positively resolved, meaning the, perpetrate, the, perpetrate, the perpetrators were not caught. So in one case, uh, ID, an IDP had his car smashed. In another case, IDPs had his, uh, an IDP had his, uh, had his uh, leg broken. Of uh, uh, number a number of DPs uh, report that they are getting they are getting calls or text messages saying that go back to Donbass you don't belong here, and so on. Uh, on unemployment, perhaps unemployment and employment uh, for most of the DPs the most two two most important issues are unemployment and housing. According to the June 2018 survey done by the ministry, which well, deals with their issues. 58% 50, uh, of IDPs are currently unemployed. However, I need to remember that in Ukraine, in Ukraine uh, the term unemployed does not really mean that you do not have a job. You can register as somebody unemployed, receive the financial aid from the state, and illegally work somewhere, I don't know, on a market or in a store or something like that. So you should not take with statistic at face value. How many of them are really unemployed? Nobody knows. According to the according to the survey, the least number of unemployed people, unemployed IDPs, the least number of unemployed IDPs is in Kiev. 79% of them who move to Kiev have a job. The um, accumulation of negative stereotypes and uh, poor social poor. Uh, poor social status of RDPs forced many of them, not all of them, but many of them to go through an identity crisis. Uh, they are sort of in a situation between hammer and anvil. Now they left, they left occupied, occupied territories of Donbass, so many of them, for people who remained in Donbass, these people are traitors, betrayers. They arrived, they arrived into unoccupied Ukraine, on the, in Ukraine, uh, and for many, for many, uh, for many, uh, from the point of view of locals, these arrivals are, you know, suspicious separatists. So in either, in either, in either way, they are get blamed for their problems. So it's not surprising, it's, it's again not surprising that many of the DPs decided to simply change their identity. Now, I didn't receive a personal permission, but one of the, uh, one of the IDPs which I interviewed over uh, Skype, uh, she simply told me, I no longer consider I no longer consider myself Donetsk. I'm no longer from Donetsk. I'm now Vinnychanka. I'm now from Vinnytsia, and that person is a quite uh, prominent figure, public figure among the IDPs. However, I didn't receive her prob I didn't receive her permission to use her name, so I'm not I'm not going to say her name. So, the war uh, the war caused the demographic transformation of Donbas. Uh, the region, the region of Donbas, lost between uh, one third to between one third and half of its population. This new demographic reality is uh, highly unlikely to change in the forthcoming decades. What are the implications of this? Even in the event of a new future deoccupation, which I don't think is likely, the weight of Donbas in Ukrainian economy and politics will not return to pre-war levels, at least for a number of decades. Quite often, quite often, I'm from Western Ukraine, native of Western Ukraine, and quite often from uh, here I go among, from other Western Ukrainians that such an opinion that we should not deoccupy Donbass because if we deoccupy Donbass, then part of regions will return as a, poli as a major political force in Ukraine. I think, I think that's not true. Even if, even if Ukraine, let's say, tomorrow will deoccupy Donbass, uh, those people, those people who left, most of the people who left Donbass have no plans to return. So resurgence of, let's say, party of regions as major political force in Ukraine is, I think, is just unthinkable, at least in the uh, foreseeable future. Thank you. Our second speaker is Dr. Alina Chervetsova. She is Associate Professor, Faculty of Law, Kharkiv National University from Ukraine. Her fields of research interest are international law and constitutional law. She graduated from National Law Academy, Kharkiv, and during 2017, she was a fellow at the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. The topic of her presentation is hybrid war and hybrid law, the Minsk agreements in the context of international law and Ukrainian legislation. 
I understood that in, in, among invited speakers, I am the only one uh, lawyer, and I would like to speak today about the Minsk agreements in terms of international and Ukrainian constitutional law. I will do my best not to go to political side and to uh, limit my presentation by legal frame. The form of warfare which Russia has employed in Ukraine, annexing Crimea, and now in Ukraine's Donbass, is known as a hybrid war. Unfortunately, international law is not prepared to react and to deal with hybrid conflicts. It was clear how to respond to classical war. And international law is confused about hybrid conflicts. What should be done? Then country is attacked by a mixture of special forces. There is an informational campaign. There are proxy uh, units and uh, quasi-military units. What should be done in this case? What should be done in the case then a state is attacked by state with this, with this uh, a victim state has very strong political, historical, and cultural relations. What should be done in this case? How should international law react on hybrid war and hybrid conflict? What are the uh, mechanisms for peace building? What is the responsibility for hybrid attacks? Is hybrid war is still war in terms of international law, or it's something else? Is hybrid attack is violation of security and territorial integrity of the state. So there are a lot of other questions which have been raised by hybrid conflicts. The Minsk agreements is an attempt to answer at least one of the problems related to Ukraine. The Minsk agreements, they have a hybrid nature in terms both of national and international law. On the one hand, the Minsk agreements don't constitute a binding international treaty in classical understanding of this term, but they are not a part of Ukrainian legislation. But from the other side, the Minsk agreement do play some role in conflict settlement, because that some actors involved in this conflict uh, do recognize some provisions of the Minsk agreements from time to time. From one side, the Minsk agreements is a hybrid law. But from the other side, at the same time, the Minsk agreements are the only one agreement between Russia and Ukraine regarding peace building, regarding restoring peace. And this is the political value of the Minsk agreements. But I would like to speak today about legitimacy and legality of the Minsk agreements. And I would like to address two questions in my presentation. First, I would like to speak about legal qualifications of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. And then I will analyze national and international dimensions of the Minsk agreements. But first, um, let me make one general remark. In accordance with Article 1 of the United Nations Charter, the maintenance of international peace and security is the purpose of the United Nations. However, despite the international peace was breached many, many times, states responsible for such actions were not sanctioned in a systematic manner. And this is a problem of international law. And this is a problem of United Nations, especially the problem is in case then a state, which is a permanent member of Council, Security Council of United Nations, is involved in the conflict. And situation with, with Ukraine is a very good example. So what did United Nations say about uh, Russian-Ukrainian, about Russian-Ukrainian conflict? After the Security Council failed to uh, react on situation in Ukraine, 
In March 2014, the General Assembly of uh, United Nations adopted Resolution 68-262, Territorial Integrity of Ukraine. It's a very interesting uh, document with very interesting political rhetoric. Because it, from one side, this is reaction on annexation of Crimea. But from the other side, uh, this document says nothing about Russian occupation and Russian aggression. United Nations says that it supports Ukraine, it recognizes territorial integrity of Ukraine and doesn't recognize legality of uh, uh, 2014 uh, referendum in Crimea. But it doesn't make connection, doesn't make any link between the fact that Ukraine lost Crimea and activity from the side of Russian Federation. It's very interesting to stress that this resolution was supported by 100 states. Um, 11 states voted against uh, this resolution, and this resolution was proposed by Canada, Lithuania, Poland, Costa Rica, and Ukraine. The United Nations was very accurate in its uh, assessments of uh, Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Contrary to this position, we have European regional organizations, and these organizations are more, much more outspoken regarding Russian-Ukrainian conflict. One of the first documents which said that hostile activity from Russian side against Ukraine was aggression, uh, it was a document, resolution of the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, which was adopted in 2014, resolution on clear, gross, and uncorrected violations of Helsinki principles by the Russian Federation. In this document, the OEC condemns the clear, gross, and uncorrected violations of the Helsinki principles, including territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine, it condemns occupation of the territory of Ukraine. So the document officially uh, stressed that the 2014 referendum in Crimea was an illegitimate and illegal act, and the results of this uh, referendum has no, have no validity. Also, in this document, it was stressed that uh, Russian actions against Ukraine, it was act of military aggression, and this military aggression was not provoked by Ukraine. So according to this document, according to this resolution, uh, Ukraine is a victim of aggression from the side of Russian Federation. The OEC uh, repeated its uh, position in a number of other documents, for instance, um, uh, in 2015, next year, the OEC adopted next resolution on the continuation of clear, gross, and uncorrected violations of the OEC commitments and international norms by the uh, Russian Federation. And it's very interesting to stress in this document, uh, OEC calls on the Russian Federation to halt its destabilization campaign in Ukraine including the escalation of the conflict in certain areas of the Donetsk and Lugansk region, and a uh, very interesting provision and very important provision for the qualification of uh, uh, situation in Ukraine. The OEC further calls on the Russian Federation to stop the supply any fl and, flow, uh, and flow of heavy weaponry ammunition units of the Russian armed forces across the Russian border into eastern Ukraine cease providing any military, financial, or logistical aid to illegal armed groups in the Donetsk and Lugansk region of Ukraine. So from the very beginning, for, for the um, OSC, situation was clear, despite the hybrid type of uh, the, this conflict. Um, then we had a resolution adopted by the Council of Europe, resolution 2132, adopted uh, in 2016, political consequences uh, of uh, the Russian aggression in Ukraine. And here we have again the same rhetoric. Uh, Russian Federation is called uh, aggressor, and uh, the Council of Europe uh, expresses its concern about uh, political consequences uh, which are negative both for Ukraine and for um, security and stability uh, in Europe as a whole. For Ukraine, conflict has resulted in the violation of its sovereignty and territorial integrity. 
Then we had a uh, number of the documents adopted by the European Union and so on and so on. And here I would like to now speak about uh, how this situation uh, is uh, qualified and was qualified until recently uh, in Ukrainian legislation. Because that Ukraine on the national level in its legislation used very unclear rhetoric. And it followed uh, example showed by the United Nations until recently. Um, here you have a list of the documents adopted by the Ukrainian parliament. Parliament says about uh, aggression, but I want to stress that these documents are not a law. These are declarations, announcements, resolutions uh, of the uh, Verkhovna Rada. Um, then we had, again, resolutions, resolutions, uh, appeals to the international organizations, to international community. But on the law, we had very interesting qualification of this conflict. If uh, um, Russian Federation is aggressor, Ukraine should use law on defense of Ukraine. But instead of this, Ukraine preferred to protect its sovereignty and territorial integrity having anti-terrorist operation. So, and I think this is two different political rhetoric and legal rhetoric. One thing is to protect your own country against aggression, and another thing is to protect your country against terrorists. So qualification of the conflict is different. Uh, don't ask me why it happened, <laughs> because that instead of legal analysis, you will have my speculations about uh, political life in Ukraine. I will just uh, want to say that only this year, at the beginning of this year, Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine adopted the law on the occupation. So the short name of this uh, law is law on the occupation. The long, the official name of this law is law on the peculiarities of the state policy to ensure Ukraine's state sovereignty over temporarily occupied territories in Donetsk and Lugansk region. This law came in force uh, in February to, uh, 24, 2018, so this year. It took Ukraine four years officially to recognize officially that Russia is aggressor. This law says the Russian Federation initiated, organized, and supported terrorist activities in Ukraine. Russian Federation carries out armed aggression against Ukraine and temporary, temporary occupation of parts of its territory using regular units and units of the armed forces and other military formations of the Russian Federation. Accordingly, accordingly anti-terrorist operations anti-terrorist operation that Ukraine had since then is measures to restore sovereignty and territorial integrity. And now the Ukrainian armed forces are responsible for this, not uh, the security services of, of Ukraine, but militaries, like it should be in case of international aggression. Now let me speak about the Minsk agreements. Here, again, we have very interesting situation. We have different understanding of the Minsk agreements in Ukrainian legislation and in international law. Uh, national dimension of Minsk agreements. The Minsk agreements violate constitution of Ukraine and Ukrainian legislation. Uh, there is a law on Ukrainian law on international treaties, and this law regulates all issues regarding conclusion, accomplishment, and termination of international treaties. The Minsk agreements, by the, because of their context, because of uh, their um, meaning, uh, fall into a category of agreements which signed on behalf of Ukraine, and that means that this agreement should be signed by the president of Ukraine or according to his order. From Ukrainian side, the Minsk agreements were signed by Leonid Kuchma. There was a decree 
And according to this decree, which was adopted on July 2014, Leonid Kuchma was authorized to participate in triliterate contact group on peaceful settlement of situation in Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast with the participation of the representative of Ukraine, the special representative of the Organization for Security and Cooperation, ambassador of the Russian Federation to Ukraine. But you know that the Minsk agreements, Minsk II and Minsk I and Minsk II, both are signed not only by representative from Russian Federation and signed not only by the representative of the OEC, but also by the leaders of separatists. According to this decree, Kuchma was not authorized to deal, to negotiate, okay, to negotiate with uh, these, let's call them actors. Uh, and the last uh, paragraph of this uh, decree is that Kuchma performs his functions on voluntary basis. So it means that he was a private person there. And here we have international law and how international law sees the Minsk agreements. There is UN Security Council resolution adopted on 17 February 2015, just after Minsk uh, II was signed. And according to this resolution, uh, the UN Security Council endorses the package of measures for the implementation of the Minsk agreements. Uh, Council of Europe also, in one of her, its uh, resolutions, referred to the uh, Minsk agreements, um, the same with the organization of um, security and cooperation in Europe. So Minsk agreements now have international recognition, but they violate Ukrainian constitution and Ukrainian law. It cannot be that private person signs document which uh, means to make changes in constitution. To fulfill, to implement the Minsk agreements, it means that from Ukrainian side, political part of the Minsk agreements means that Ukraine has to give a special status to Donetsk and Lugansk region. And it means that Ukraine has to change constitution. But a private person cannot put a signature under this type of documents. What should Ukraine do? The easiest way, and some voices say that Ukraine should abandon the international, the Minsk agreements, but I think that is not a right position. I would suggest Ukraine to ratify the Minsk agreements, and I will tell you why. The Minsk agreements are connected to sanctions, and Russia is sanctioned by the US, by the EU, um, not only because that it violated territorial integrity, uh, and uh, sovereignty of Ukraine. But first of all, because that it's violating the Minsk agreements. And then I think Ukraine can use Article 52 of the Vienna Convention because that the conditions under which Ukraine signed the Minsk, agre Minsk agreement, Minsk II, I think they are according uh, under this Article 52, which says the treaty is void if its conclusion has been procured by the threat, of, threat or use of force in violation of the principles of international law. Also, ratifying the uh, Minsk agreements, Ukraine can make reservations. And in these reservations, it should be clear that Ukraine has a right to decide about the status of the Donetsk and Lugansk region by its own. So this part of the Minsk agreements, which is political part, violates, contradicts the Vienna Convention. But the part of the Minsk agreements, which is about uh, uh, ceasefire, is in accordance with the international law. And I would suggest if I'm asked to do this. So to ratify, but ratify with reservations and with the reference to the Vienna Convention. In this case, Ukraine will show that it's ready to participate and is ready to fulfill its international obligations, and Russian Federation will have, again, again problems with the international law, but probably they don't care about this. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. Our last speaker is Dr. Sergei Kodela, uh, who is an associate professor of political science at Baylor University, where he teaches courses on civil war, terrorism, uh, post-Soviet politics. Earlier, he held teaching and research positions at the John Hopkins University, George Washington University, University of Toronto, and National University Kyiv Mahila Academy, Ukraine. He received his PhD in international relations from John Hopkins University and a MA in political science from Stanford. The topic of his presentation will be how can political science findings on civil war settlements inform conflict resolution in Donbass? The goal of my uh, paper uh, is to uh, review and analyze various findings from the quantitative and qualitative articles, publications in political science dealing with the most effective mechanisms of ending intrastate conflicts. And of course it is based on the premise that on one hand um, the conflict that is happening right now in Ukraine has an international dimension and Russia is an aggressor and Russia is certainly providing a lot of support, uh, financial, material, etc., ideational to the rebels in Donbass. But it also is based on the second premise, and that is there is an internal component to this conflict. And that internal component, we discussed uh, the, the various um, expressions of this internal component in the first panel. And I've been uh, traveling across the bus over the last couple of um, months uh, doing field research there. And if you talk to people in different cities, in different towns of Donbass, you will definitely notice that internal component. Because once you start asking people, do you actually know the insurgents? Do you know people who are standing on the checkpoints in the first few months of the conflict? They would say, yes, they were my neighbors. They were my classmates. They were my colleagues from my job. You will actually hear a lot of interesting stories about people who were members of the same family. One stayed in government-controlled areas. Another went to separatist-controlled areas. And that is primarily because these people had very different ideas about the way um, uh, how Donbass should look like and where, whether it should be part of Ukraine or not. That internal component, I think, should be taken very seriously when we are thinking about designing the settlement for the Donbass conflict. And that's what I intend to do over the next 15 minutes. But first, I want to talk a little about the view of the war in the Ukrainian society today. And I want to do a little detour um, and uh, talk about uh, George Orwell's homage to Catalonia, his book where he recollects his experience um, fighting in the Spanish Civil War. Um, and somewhere in the mid, mid, midway through the book, um, he returns to Barcelona after spending several months on the front lines. And he says he finds a very different city, a city that is completely apathetic, that is completely disinterested in what's going on in the front lines. A city where there are a lot of food shortages, long queues, filled restaurants, restaurants that are filled with people who are having a good time, right? A city that basically exists outside completely of the context of the conflict. He said just a few months ago, it was a very different city. And he characterizes the situation with this phrase, nobody wanted to lose the war, but the majority were chiefly anxious for the war to be over. And I think it's a very, uh, accurate uh, characterization of the way the Ukrainian society feels and thinks about the uh, armed conflict in Donbass. Because if you've traveled to Ukraine recently, you, whether you went to eastern Ukraine or western Ukraine or uh, Kiev or other parts of Ukraine, you would see that the war sounds, looks very distant. That even in Kramatorsk, for example, or in Drushkivka or in Pokrovsk, well, you will have a hard time seeing the examples of the armed conflict around you. And just a couple of um, polling results from the last few months. Consistently over the last four months, if Ukrainian Ukrainians were asked, what are the most important issues that faces the country today? The majority were always pointing to the war in Donbass. So initially, earlier, before the conflict began, it was either the high prices, inflation, unemployment, corruption, these were the issues that people thought were topical. Right now, consistently for the last four years, war is the number one issue. And actually, a very interesting question was asked by the IRI. 
in May, June, uh, the polling they did uh, just a couple of months ago. What would the Ukrainian authorities need to do for the Ukrainian society to actually trust them again? Because as you know, the popularity rating of Poroshenko, of the Ukrainian parliament, is very low. And 71% said that the way to increase trust is to end the war in Donbass. That this is the only way through which the Ukrainian society will regain trust in the authorities and the war. Now, the question, of course, is how are we going to end the war? And here, the results are also very interesting. Consistently, and over the last couple of years, the number of people who think that the use of force, that the force should be used to end the war, we can actually think of the settlement through the use of force, has been below 20%. And in fact, about 50% are willing to make certain compromises. In other words, negotiate, bargain, and make compromises to end the war. And in fact, 19.7% are willing to make any compromises to end the war. So altogether, about two-thirds of the Ukrainian society right now are willing to make compromises, right, to end the war. Now, we are in the middle of the presidential campaign right now in Ukraine. What are the presidential candidates saying about the armed conflict? Not a whole lot. And there is a good reason for why they're not saying a whole lot about the armed conflict in Ukraine, because anything they say may be very controversial. So in very general terms, um, I will just outline three approaches to the way the armed conflict can be ended from the standpoint of Ukrainian elites. The first approach is the approach associated with the current president, Petro Poroshenko, is basically let's keep on sanctioning Russia, putting additional more pressure on Russia, keep the international uh, alliance intact that he managed to build, he argues he built it over the last couple of years, keep the Minsk Accords, stick to them because they allow us to continue sanctioning Russia, and meanwhile, try to recover, to focus on economic recovery of the rest of Donbass, and use that as a model to persuade the people who are living in the occupied territories uh, to actually start supporting the Ukrainian government more. This is the first approach of Mr. Poroshenko. Yuli Tymoshenko, the current front runner in the presidential race, by contrast, suggests that we need to completely change the international format in which these talks are happening. She suggests that we need to create a new multilateral setting that will be based on the Budapest Memorandum through which we are going to launch new talks with Russia. Why would you say, why would you uh, may ask, why does she refer to the Budapest Memorandum? Why is it so important? Very simply because she argues that we need to bring the United States and the UK to the negotiating table. At this point, only Germany and France are the ones who are negotiating with us, right? And she says we need the American leverage to help us put greater pressure on the Russian Federation. The third approach has been formulated by Viktor Pinchuk. You can call it the oligarchic consensus in Ukraine, Pinchuk and Akhmedov. Um, they're saying that we need to make a grand bargain with Russia. Uh, and the grand bargain means we need to promise permanent neutrality for Ukraine in the security sphere and try to downplay our rhetoric about Crimea. So not mention Crimea as much, but just prioritize the, the settlement on Donbass over Crimea. Uh, of course, there are political candidates who are running exactly with this kind of platform. Now, all of these three approaches have one thing in common. They all focus on the international dimension of the conflict. None of the serious presidential candidates are actually talking about the internal component of the conflict. In other words, they're not really saying how exactly are we going to bring these territories back and reintegrate these territories with the people who live there, with the new elites that emerged over the last four years, how are we going to reintegrate them back in Ukraine? And I argue that um, basically you need to pursue a dual track approach that yes, there has to be an international negotiations that has to take place with Russia and Russia needs to uh, basically participate in any bargain that may appear. But at the same time, it's very important to think about the bargain as far as, as how it relates to the local elites, right? What exactly are we going to offer to them? Why is it so important? Well, it's important because the incompatibilities that existed back in 2014 that gave rise to this conflict, the cleavages that were there, the uh, hostility towards the Ukrainian government, the lack of legitimacy of the Ukrainian government is still there. 
And here I'm using the poll numbers from the German poll that was done in 2017 in uncontrolled territories. You may be familiar with the work of Gwendolyn Sass. She is the one who did this poll. And she showed that in the territories that are not in, of Donbass, that are not controlled by, by Ukraine, uh, trust in Poroshenko has been uh, at, the, at a very low point, 6%, 6 which is a little lower than in the rest of Ukraine. The rest of Ukraine is probably about 11% or 12%. But interestingly, the trust in Putin is at the level of 64%. Okay? There is also um, a lower attachment to the Ukrainian state. 54% of the residents of uncontrolled territories say they feel less Ukrainian. And greater identification as a Russian. 26% feel more Russian. Uh, and finally, um, it's interesting that there is a split, and I think David Marbles referred to these numbers, among the residents of DNR, LNR, about the future of these territories. 44.5% of respondents said they want some kind of future with Russia, while uh, about 35% said we need an autonomy within Ukraine. And overall, the majority actually felt that they can have a future as part of Ukraine. Another reason why we think about, need to think about this internal component is because actually Ukraine has been moving in a very different direction. Right? It has been moving into a more, um, I would say, ethnic-based nation-building uh, strategy. It started with the decommunization laws, which basically legislated who are the heroes and who are the villains in Ukraine and how we interpret history. Um, then it moved to the education law, which banned uh, the use of uh, the, the teaching in the in the Russian language starting from uh, secondary school upwards. Um, the new language law, as you know, introduces very restrict restrictive quotas for the use of uh, foreign language, and that's of course targets Russian language in the public sphere. And the very recent development uh, related to the autocephalous Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the possible conflicts that may emerge out of that. We don't really know how this will play out, but certainly people who belong to the Moscow Patriarchate, and that's millions of Ukrainians, more, many of them are in Donbass, feel very intimidated by this movement. They feel uncertain. So these developments in Ukraine, where Ukraine is actually moving in the further direction from uh, the rest of Donbass as far as political preferences are concerned, also necessitate a more serious thinking about the way these regions would be integrated. And I argue that there are three important questions that need to be addressed in an agreement that may be reached uh, with the locals in uh, these republics. First, it's about security and political guarantees to the leadership, both the military leadership and the civilian leadership of these republics, as far as their uh, physical security is concerned, but also uh, the, the guarantees of their political representation. Uh, in the local assemblies, for example, once these republics will be reintegrated into Ukraine. The second set of questions refers to the institutional guarantees to the residents, local civilians who live in these republics. What are the guarantees that their rights will be honored, that their po political and cultural rights will be respected once they are integrated into Ukraine? Um, how can we actually ensure that they will believe in these long-term promises of Ukraine? And the third very important question is the question about transitional justice. In other words, how are we going to prosecute the abuses that have been happening on both sides um, over the last four years of the war? So the first very important question is, of course, the question of power sharing. And uh, one of the findings of the literature is that in most of the agreements uh, that ended civil wars, uh, actually in two-thirds of the agreements, there were certain power sharing provisions. And in Ukraine, many are sort of concerned about the possibility of some call, what some call a Bosnian scenario, where you basically try to impose uh, on the national level certain quotas for the representation of Donbass that, and allowing Donbass representatives, for example, to veto some of the decisions of the executive on the national level. I argue that this is a very legitimate concern, and this is not the way we actually have to go. What, the way we have to go is to pursue territorial power sharing rather than the executive power sharing. Territorial power sharing expands power of certain groups on the local level, right? but it does not necessitate changes on the national level. And in this sense, the use of the territorial autonomy has the strongest effect on the durability of peace following the settlement. A number of studies, one after another, compared um, these various ways through which power sharing has been conducted. 
And they found that actually territorial autonomy has been the most effective mechanism of ensuring a sustainable peace after the settlement. Now, there are also legitimate concerns about the territorial autonomy for Donbass. And I actually was at the Radio for Euro uh, Europe Radio Liberty show, talk show a couple of weeks ago, uh, where I suggested that this may be a possibility, and the telephone turned red. Everyone was calling and uh, complaining about this uh, guy who is uh, uh, offering certain very subversive ideas about uh, offering the, uh, autonomy to Donbass. So I admit it's a controversial idea. One of the reasons why we have to be concerned is this theory of the segment state. Uh, uh, the political scientist from the University of San Diego suggested that um, political, these the autonomous, autonomous structures create institutions that reinforce group identities and allow local leaders to use these institutions to challenge the state later on. But he also suggested that there is, an, uh, uh, there is a possible remedy for that, and that remedy is called multiple majority strategy, where rather than centralizing authority in this autonomous unit, you actually devolve power to multiple towns around this, uh, in this autonomous region and allow these local towns basically pursue the kinds of issues that are important for these local communities. And in this sense, you preclude the creation of what he calls hegemonic identity in this particular region. And you allow for a diversity of various policies to be implemented. And since the regions of Donbass, the communities in Donbass are becoming more and more diverse because of the natural reasons they have been separated for four years, I think actually that strategy may be quite viable uh, in the case of uh, Donbass. Okay, very quickly, uh, some of the other ideas have to do with the disarmament and demobilization of combatants. And here, of course, one of the remedies for that, to ensure that there is an effective demobilization, you need some kind of third-party security guarantees. And these security guarantees oftentimes come from the peacekeeping, deployment of peacekeeping troops. The sticking, sticking point for the peacekeeping right now is, of course, the composition. One of the sticking point is the composition. But the argument in multiple articles in political science is that these peacekeeping deployment uh, troops actually have to have credibility with both sides. So the mixture of the countries is an essential, should be an essential component to, uh, to the solution. In other words, the peacekeeping units should represent both uh, the sides that have credibility with the insurgents and also the sides that have credibility with the Ukrainian authorities. Rebel to, to party transformation, the transformation of the rebel groups into political parties that would then be allowed to compete in the political process on the local level is another essential element of such a bargain that is very common in these kinds of agreements. And finally, the uh, comprehensive amnesty for all the people who participated in the conflict. And in fact, a number of studies show that the comprehensive amnesty is the most effective mechanism to prevent spoiling on the part of people who may be potentially targeted for some kind of uh, prosecution. But uh, that idea, comprehensive amnesty, is actually very controversial. Only 7% of Ukrainians support comprehensive amnesty. So there are alternative instruments through which accountability can be achieved. Achieving accountability, of course, is a very legitimate uh, demand on the part of the society. One of such instruments is the establishment of the truth commissions that do not have the power to prosecute, but allow us to establish a public record that will show who was a perpetrator of abuse and how often that abuse happened. And through that, through publicizing responsibility, you achieve some kind of accountability on the national level. In Colombia right now, you know they had a problem with FARC uh, for decades. Now you have a special tribunal that has limited prosecutorial uh, capacity against the most serious egregious abuses. So that may be another instrument which can be, uh, which can be used. And finally, the uh, final point is about elections. Um, Elections are often mentioned when we're thinking about the conflict resolution as the first step, but in fact, political science literature argues that this should not be the first step because the, uh, if you hold elections right away, uh, you will basically run into the problem of a very polarized environment with people who had problems with access to information, um, and there will be eventually not a level playing field, a very unfair um, uh, uh, playing field for political actors. As a result, the general advice is to have a two or three years delay uh, for the 
security for order to actually t uh, come through these territories through the use of UN peacekeepers or some kind of international transitional governance. And only after that, after the IDP is returned to these territories, you can actually hold elections and then uh, move with the transition process. There are a number of very important outstanding questions that I have not addressed because of the limitations, obviously, of the political science literature. And these questions are peculiar to the Donbass conflict. Uh, one of them has to do with the financial responsibility for restoring the infrastructure. That has to be clearly outlined in the bargain. Another has to do with property. You know that there has been a lot of looting over the last four years, both of minor assets and also of large assets, companies, industries. How are you going to resolve ownership disputes that will eventually emerge once the reintegration pro process happens? That needs to be addressed as well in the agreement. And finally, uh, all the questions related to Russia, both about the terms of withdrawal of Russian military hardware, but also about the guarantees that this region will receive in terms of the economic relations with Russia, both having access to cultural media um, uh, space that Russia offers and uh, to market that Russia offers. These guarantees uh, are essential for that region to be able to accept this bargain. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, as far as the political elites of Ukraine, what do you think has been to make them consider the domestic component of this peace, peacekeeping solution, conflict resolution solution? <coughs> Second question. My name is Elena Venturova. I am a Ukrainian <coughs> journalist for the Kiev Post newspaper, and my question is to Ernest. So, what's your take on the other side of the IDP's problem? Namely, when IDPs go back to the uh, occupied territories, obviously when kings were quieted there, just because they couldn't deal with stigma they faced in the cities they relocated to in the first place. I have a question for Sergei. You mentioned that Donbass should receive some sort of a, a new autonomy. And I've been wrestling with this question. If we take uh, Ukrainian history, history of Donbass, starting from the Brezhnev period, it's been quite autonomous. And after the uh, independence, Ukrainian independence, well, this well, this has been one of the most privileged Ukrainian regions. So what kind of autonomy are we talking about? Full independence or how do we measure it? And the second question, I mean, this is the same question, but uh, the main objective of the Russian Federation when it comes to Ukraine, I think this is an open secret, is to bar Ukraine from joining NATO. What kind of guarantees are you willing to uh, provide the Russian Federation with uh, to ensure that Ukraine will not be a part of NATO. Well, this is spoken by all major Russian policymakers, by everyone. So, uh, letting Russian military experts to Ukraine to supervise how it's all going on, well, this is how the First World War started, actually. This is one of the demands of the Austro-Hungarian Empire to the Serbs. Uh, I have a question to Professor Kudela regarding uh, multi multiple majority strategy. What like exact cases do we have of like this strategy applied and how successful they were? Like you know, like where maybe they it failed or we have like one hundred percent of like, success. And what like were you know like factors that led to failure of this strategy? If they were. Uh, Arina, I want to just remind that uh, not only Kuchma, uh, the Harchenko and the Polotnitsky signed Minsk too as a private person because uh, the reason the same. So. Uh, Minsk II is contradict their unrecognized constitutions. And the uh, second question is that uh, uh, Minsk II did, doesn't include uh, peacemaking mechanism. This is very strange for cease, ceasefire treaties. So Daumus treaty, which resolved o Ossetian war, South Ossetian war, included this peacemaking, peacemaking mechanism, joint, uh, joint control commission, and the joint peacekeeping army. And the Moscow uh, agreement, uh, which uh, resolved con conflict, uh, uh, Transnistrian conflict, uh, did the same. So this was the original, initial uh, flow of the Minsk, uh, Minsk II. Uh, so I, I would like to know your opinion. And uh, uh, Sergei, if Donbass obtains autonomy, what is the territory? DNL uh, or uh, Lugansk Oblast and uh, Donetsk Oblast. So big, there are big territorial difference between two solutions. I can go first to replying to Lena's question about uh, 
the IDPs who at first moved out of the occupied territories of the Nubas and then faced social difficulties and returned back to the occupied territories. Well, they still they still uh, claim the status of the IDP. So, as far as I know, according to the official state statistic, not a single person ever actually relinquished relinquished status of the IDP. Meaning, I claim that I'm IDP, and I'm submitting documents that I'm no longer going to be an, uh, an IDP. Everybody is looking for uh, there is a Russian saying saying uh, uh, So everybody is looking for his for his for her her own benefit. So I, my personal my personal take, which is uh, has zero importance, because what's important is what people like Tuka or Chernesh or Poroshenko think about these people. But my personal take, uh, I completely understand those people. And if I, if I was in their situation, I probably would do the same. If I, if I, leave, that, uh, if I leave the occupied territories and uh, everywhere I go, I'm being projected, then what choice do I have, really, to go where I was before? OK, many good questions. Um, so let's start with a question from Professor Rish. We already had the discussion about the Minsk agreements. And in the case of Minsk, um, there is only one reason uh, why President Poroshenko and Poroshenko's faction in the parliament has been voting to renew every year the special status for DPR and LPR. And that reason has been publicly stated many times whenever they were voting by the speaker of the parliament, Andriy Parubi, right? That reason is the West, the position of the European diplomats, the position of American diplomats. This is the main actor that has any leverage over the Ukrainian elites. So when you're asking what, will, what should the political elites, how can they agree to this solution or take it seriously, I think pressure from the West is the only answer. Uh, I think this is the only way through which uh, they would start think through this uh, alternative seriously. Question about uh, autonomy. Um, it's, I'm surprised you're talking about autonomy in, in the Soviet Union. There were no autonomous in the Soviet Union. There was. The autonomy didn't mean anything in the Soviet Union, okay? What kind of autonomy do I actually mean right now, right, for Donbass? Um, I think cultural autonomy is a very important uh, element. Um, the use of the Russian language, um, which, as you know, you may, you, may be, you may or may not be familiar. You're from Russia. I'm from Ukraine. I'm in Kiev right now, and I'm familiar with the political debates that are happening in Kiev. And the political debates are... How many, uh, what is the percentage of uh, um, um, words uh, that we are allow, that we would allow to be spoken public in Russian in movie theaters around Ukraine? Okay, what is the percentage? Is it 10% or is it 15%? Do you really think that people in Donbass will buy this? They would re they really accept this kind of a law which would limit the use of the Russian language in movie theaters, in newspapers, in uh, television to 10%, it's not going to happen. Never, right? So cultural autonomy, the rights of people in the in Donbass to use the Russian language as much as they want is a very essential component of this bargain. The second, of course, is the issue of the economic sphere. And as I mentioned, access to the Russian market and continued trade with Russia is a very important component. Uh, the issue of how much revenues they're going to keep uh, from their enterprises is also very important to economic autonomy, maybe. Uh, and also the uh, issue of law enforcement. Um, it's actually mentioned in the law on the special status that the composition of the local police would be primarily determined by the local authorities. I think both the judiciary and the law enforcement should be drawn from the local sources, and they should receive significant power over how much and what would be that composition. Of course, the military, the deployment of the military units is a separate issue, and we can argue about the balance between the military and the police, but the law enforcement component is a very important issue of, the, of that autonomous status. As far as neutrality is concerned, um, so I was speaking about the inter inter internal dimension. I'm not, I was not planning to address the international dimension, but since, since you asked me, one of the possibilities through which that kind of a deal can be made with Russia, of course, is you look at the examples of Austria. Uh, of 1954, and you remember how the neutrality of Austria, Austria has been adopted through the multi, in the multilateral format with the Soviet Union, and you had the United States, I think you had Britain. So there were guarantees on both sides where there was a certain um, 
uh, agreement on with the inclusion of multiple uh, representatives from multiple powers. Uh, that's a possibility. I'm not advocating for that, but I'm just suggesting that it's possible. Multiple majority strategy, uh, a question from Yaroslav. It's a very good question because I think Roder offered that as a theoretical proposition, right? And I'm not sure actually whether we had empirical cases where that strategy has been adopted. It's an interesting theoretical proposition to consider, and it's linked to what Kimitaka was asking about uh, the autonomy in Donbass, whether it's only for the DNR, LNR, or it's for the entire Donetsk, Luhansk Oblast. And I think that uh, idea of multiple majorities and cross-cutting majorities in these regions will work very well if you create autonomous uh, oblasts of the entire Donetsk and Luhansk. Why? Because, as you well know, particularly for Luhansk case, but also for Donetsk, these are very diverse oblasts, right? The northern parts of Luhansk are part of Slobozhanshina. They are all pre predominantly Ukrainian speakers. You basically prevent by uh, expanding uh, these uh, DNR, LNR republics and including these more pro-Ukrainian parts, if you if you may say that, pro-Ukrainian parts, the people who are more attached to the Ukrainian state in these autonomous provinces, we would actually prevent them from becoming these internal obstacles to the consolidation of the Ukrainian state, from becoming a hindrance for Ukrainian state building process. Autonomy for the entire oblast is, is the strategy that I would uh, advocate, advocate. Thank you very much for um, your question regarding the Minsk agreements and uh, in the context with their other agreements regarding uh, peace uh, restoring. Yes, and this is a problem of the Minsk agreements that they don't set a specific deadline then they should be, uh, by which they should be implemented. And in case of the ceasefire, it means, I think, that the, this mean, the Minsk agreement should be implemented immediately. And regarding ceasefire, or you have implementation of this agreement or you don't have, and it's very clear from the, from the uh, beginning. About private person, persons, yes, we had three private persons, citizens of Ukraine, uh, solving uh, questions which have very high constitutional level. That's why I think that political part of the Minsk agreements is not valid, but because that the Minsk agreements are connected to uh, the sanctions against Russian Federation, Ukraine shouldn't get out from the Minsk agreements. Uh, because that it will be very difficult to reach another agreement and to receive this international recognition. Economical sanctions, they are uh, they they are difficult not only for for Russian uh, economy. It's also they have also negative effect for the countries which uh, use economical sanctions. So and for Ukraine it will be probably difficult to receive this recognition uh, recognition of new agreements with Russian Federation and uh, to connect these new agreements with Russian Federation to the sanctions. Let me posit the, uh, the cynical <coughs> analysis of why this thing is going on, and that is that the regime, the kleptocratic regime in Moscow, preserves itself in power by having the fortress Russia and external enemies, and otherwise you'll have pressure from their own people for regime change, and the kleptocrats are terrified of that. And in Ukraine, why they haven't really made great progress uh, is they also have a corrupt regime which uses the conflict in Donbass to justify why there isn't greater reform, why there isn't a clampdown on all these um, corrupt oligarchs. So is a peace proposal really realistic taking into account the two regimes that exist? And the last question? Um, first of all, when, why, why would Ukrainians um, trust Russians to honor any agreement? They didn't honor it under the Budapest memorandum. They violate terms and don't fulfill their terms in the Minsk agreements. They violate international law in all kinds of other areas these days. So uh, how can you enter into negotiations with a partner that's totally unreliable? Um, 
it seems to me that, you know, if Ukraine is, and, and the talk is often about Ukraine has to make concessions, Ukraine has to do this, you know, maybe it just has to give up uh, uh, Crimea, whatever, and give autonomy to things. What do the Russians have to give up, or what are the people in Donetsk and uh, Donbass, what, what's, what are they going to put on the table as part of this quid pro quo? Because it seems it's often very, very one-sided. Thank you. Well, uh, do you know of any wars that ended without agreements? No, there has to be an agreement. Right? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I just think that the Ukraine should say, okay, you want to have pres you have certain language rights for Russians in, in, in Ukraine, you'll get them. What about Ukrainian language rights in Russia or Ukrainian cultural rights in Russia? They're trampled all the time. They've been trampled for, for ages. I mean, there's, there's got to be some kind of trade-off here. I want to see what they're going to put on the table. Uh, maybe they should, if the Russians withdraw their military forces from uh, Crimea and restore its autonomous status, and declare it a military-free zone, then Ukraine should say, fine, we'll look at making Ukraine a neutral state. But right now, let us remember that most Ukrainians did not want to join NATO, and that that number that's pro-NATO keeps growing. Why? Thanks to Russian aggression. It wasn't Ukrainians that uh, are driving this thing. All right. Well, I think the balance of power between the two sides uh, makes this kind of a strategy a little complicated. I, I understand where you're coming from, and I wish we could behave like you're suggesting. Uh, but I think in the near future, given uh, the prospects of our GDP growth and how far, how, how many more years we need to wait until we reach the 2013 levels, right, of GDP, uh, I don't think we are, we'll be able to be in a good position to make these demands on Russia. Um, so unfortunately, we are bargaining from a very inferior position in terms of power balance. The second point is that you, you're actually touching on a, on a critical issue, and that is the interest on both sides for that war to continue among the ruling elites. Uh, and specifically, we understand where Putin is coming from. Tatiana talked about his reasons for participation, and I agree with most of, what, of her analysis. Uh, and I agree with you that there are political reasons why Mr. Poroshenko would not be interested in a very quick resolution of the conflict, because indeed it is in his interest to continue the war and justify the limitations on political freedoms, for example, with the continuation of the war. Um, the lack of progress in the economic recovery with the continued war, right? And of course, many argue that if you bring back these areas, who are they going to vote for uh, in the presidential election? Uh, probably not for Mr. Poroshenko, right? So the electoral balance that right now exists, and there is a very good article by Paul Denieri, uh, who was my professor in Lviv back about 25 years ago. Uh, he just published an article that analyzes the political uh, utility of having these territories of Donbass and Crimea, but particularly Donbass, outside of Ukraine, because Donbass actually is more important electorally than Crimea, has been much more uh, important electorally than Crimea. And the fact that many IDPs, uh, there has been a presentation on IDPs, one thing that hasn't been mentioned, I think, is uh, the voting rights of IDPs and how complicated it is for internally displayed persons to actually participate in the elections, given various regulations that exist that require registration, et cetera, et cetera. I can only say that let's hope uh, for uh, the turnover at some point uh, and the emergence of the new political elites that would suddenly see it in their interests. Because as I mentioned in the presentation, there is a clear demand from the society. There is a clear demand for the resolution of the conflict. And I think it's possible for, given that demand, to turn that uh, for a politician, an effective politician, to turn the resolution of the conflict into a winning political strategy, right? But for that, of course, there has to be a change at the very top.